All right, good morning, HCC. How many of you are ready for hamburgers and hot dogs? How many of you are ready for a bounce house? All right. Um, We do want to welcome you to Highland Congregational Church. At this time, I'm going to excuse all of the kids pre-K through fifth grade. Uh, You can go with Pastor Brett and the one and only Mr. Jake to Children's Church. Let's give them all a big round of applause. Um, As they are dismissed, as they exit the sanctuary, I do have a couple of other announcements that I would like to share with you. Um, As many of you know, uh, over the last few months here, we have been raising money in an attempt to uh, collect enough funds to install uh, new windows uh, throughout the rest of our uh, building here. And so, uh, ultimately, we had a goal of 24000 and we reached that goal, but then we found out that, well, because of inflation and the economy and everything, those prices were a little bit higher, and so then we set out for a new goal, and that was just about a month ago or so. Well, HCC, just want to let you know that uh, through a couple of generous donations and through your faithful uh, giving, uh, we have essentially reached that goal. So we have collected all of our funds. So yes, please give yourself a round of applause. I do not have the exact figures. I will give that to you uh, in the upcoming uh, weeks here. Uh, Another announcement. Many of you are aware of the fact that uh, Sue Gibson, uh, she had her surgery not this Friday, but the Friday before. And that surgery, uh, the doctors are feeling very confident about. Uh, They were able to remove a large uh, cancerous mass uh, from her. Uh, They do have uh, biopsies that they have taken. They're waiting to hear back results from those particular tests. So we still need to be in prayer. Uh, Sue was able to come home, though, this past uh, week. She was able to come home, I believe it was on Tuesday evening. And uh, her recovery is going very well. Um, Before you know it, she'll be uh, back in charge, boss and Lonnie around like she normally does. Uh, But with that being said, uh, they are in need of some uh, assistance. They are in need of some help in regards to meals. And so specifically, they are looking for meals the next weekend. So that would be September 16th, 17th, and 18th. And so if you are willing and able to provide a meal, um, I encourage you to contact somebody from the congregation care team, uh, Julie Thiel, or one of the other members here, and uh, they will be able to get that organized, okay? Uh, So with that being said, let's uh, go to our passage today that we are going to be studying. So I need everybody to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11, John chapter 11, verses 17 through 27. That is going to be our uh, or part of the passage that we are going to be studying today. So once again, John chapter 11 verses 17 through 27, and I'm going to read that uh, for us. John chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says this. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus then said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me 
Though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. We just once again want to thank you for gathering us here today, right now, to study your precious word, your powerful word. I pray that in this passage and Jesus' words here that we would gain a greater understanding of just exactly who your son is. We would gain a greater understanding of what you accomplished through him. And I pray that as a result that we would become more confident and bold in declaring this good news about your son Jesus to a world who is in desperate and dire need of it. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, I just ask that right now you would be with us as we examine this text. I pray that you would continue to open up our spiritual eyes, ears, and heart to see, to hear, and to receive this truth, that we would continue to build our lives and our church upon it, or for the glory of your name and for the praise of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we come before you now, we pray this prayer in your Son's powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the unfortunate, one of the horrific realities that has haunted all of mankind ever since the beginning or close to the beginning of time is the unfortunate reality of death. Death has haunted every single culture and people group that has ever been in existence. Death, it is indiscriminate. Everybody dies. Whether you're rich, you're poor, you're well-known, you're famous, or you're on the underside of society. Eventually, in every single in every single person's life comes that moment when they pass away from this earth, from this day and age. Over the past couple of weeks, our society here in the United States and our world has been mainly uh, has been reminded of this horrific reality. Just a, just a week ago, about a week and a half ago maybe, there was this senseless abduction of a kindergarten teacher in Tennessee. Later on to find her body. Just absolutely senseless. And then even this past week, on Thursday, we were, we were reminded of this horrific reality once again. And even as somebody who was well-known and as prominent and as wealthy as the queen herself, eventually succumbs to death. Everybody dies. This unfortunate reality has been a cloud that has hung over basically all of humanity ever since the beginning of time. Every single person in some way, shape, or form is confronted with this stark reality. Today, though, in our passage in which we are going to be studying, we're going to see that we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus, we take a look at death a little bit differently than the rest of the world. In fact, we view death almost in complete reverse of how the world views it and understands it. And that is primarily due to what Jesus utters and declares in this passage here, that he is the resurrection and the life. And for those people who believe in him, death is not their end. You could even say that is just the beginning. This past summer, we've been going through a sermon, a summer sermon series entitled I Am. We've been going through Jesus' I Am statements found in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, John, the author there, he records 
on seven separate occasions, and Jesus declare, I am this or I am that. And every single time he says one of these I am statements, he is revealing to his listeners just exactly who he is with the hopes that they would gain a greater understanding of his true identity. And so, so far we've seen Jesus Christ declare that he is the bread of life. We've seen Jesus say that he is the light of the world. We have seen Jesus say that he is the door of the sheepfold. And just last week we took a look in John chapter 10 where Jesus, he says, and he declares that he is the good shepherd who is faithful to and who is familiar with God's people, with Jesus' followers. And so today what we are going to be doing is we're going to go on to the next I am statement. This is the fifth I am statement recorded in the Gospel of John. And in my opinion, not to belittle any of the other I am statements, but this particular I am statement is especially powerful. It, it, it describes and it, and it speaks a very powerful truth into our dark world. And with this power comes immense hope that we as Christians can gain and can glean from. And so today as we go through this particular I am statement, just like Jesus here, just how he shared these I am statements with the hope that his listeners would gain a greater understanding of just exactly who he is, that's my pastoral hope today for us as a church, for each and every single one of you. I pray that each and every single one of you would walk out of this room today before you go down to the fellowship hall and enjoy some good barbecue. I pray that you would walk out of here with a greater understanding of just exactly who Jesus is. I pray that you would walk out of here, not just that your intellect, your, your, your knowledge of him would, would increase, but I pray that you walk out of here just a little more wowed by the reality of his true identity. And then it's also my hope, and this is our mission here, not just at HCC, but this is actually every single Christian's mission. We are to go out into the world, and we are then to declare this good news about Jesus to our lost neighbors, to our lost family members, to our lost co-workers, to the lost stranger that we just happened to meet Throughout, throughout our day, throughout our week here. So let's take a look at our passage this morning. Um, I'm actually going to first direct your attention to the beginning of John chapter 11. So in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 16, I'm not going to take the time today to read through that uh, section there. Uh, I'm going to just summarize it here real quickly. This, in, in these opening 16 verses of uh, John chapter 11, it, it contains an account of how Jesus, he's actually on the other side of the Jordan River. Uh, so many of you can imagine a map of Israel in your head. Uh, to the north, there is the Sea of Galilee. To the south, there is the Dead Sea. And there is a river that runs in between them. That is the Jordan River. And so and Jesus here, he is on the east side of the Jordan River. It's referred to as the Transjordan region. And he is there ministering to certain individuals. And then all of a sudden, he receives a report. Somebody comes to him with the unfortunate news that one of his good friends, Lazarus, who's in another village, Bethany. And Bethany, this particular village, is just outside on the outskirts of Jerusalem. He receives word, that's Jesus, that his good friend Lazarus was sick and deathly ill. And then these opening verses right here, as they progress before long, another report comes to Jesus that his dear friend had actually succumbed to that particular illness and he had passed away. Our passage today, beginning in verse 17 there, we see... About four days later, after Lazarus had died, Jesus eventually makes his way to Bethany. And as he goes to Bethany, he goes there with the intention to pay his respects to the family. 
He goes there to mourn alongside Lazarus' sisters. You've got Martha and Mary. And this whole family, Jesus loves dearly. The text makes that very clear. He had a special relationship with Lazarus and both his sisters, Martha and Mary, he was close with. He loved especially. And so he goes to Bethany in order to pay his respects, in order to mourn alongside this particular family. As we take a look at verse 20, though, we see that as Jesus approached Bethany, he's not even really truly in that particular village yet. Word gets to Martha, who is in Bethany, that Jesus is almost there. And so Martha, and this is just perfect with her personality, we see this from other accounts in the Bible, Martha, she is a doer, she is a go-getter, she isn't one to sit on her hands. We see Martha get up, and she, boom, she takes off. She wants to go meet Jesus before he even arrives to their town, to their village. And then in the next verse, in verse 21, we see Martha meet Jesus on his way to Bethany. And as Martha meets Jesus, she says something to him which can be taken one of two ways. One way in which some people, just a very surface reading of this, it could be viewed as a complaint. She says there in verse 21, And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So some people view it like, Jesus, why couldn't you? I'm sorry, that was really loud. Martha, or yeah, Martha said to Jesus, Jesus, why couldn't you get here sooner? Why did you have to delay your arrival here in my town? That's though not how I believe her comment here should be understood and interpreted. I believe her comment here should actually be viewed in a different light. It should be viewed more so as a faithful regret. In her comment here, she recognized that Jesus was a very powerful person. She had this high view of Jesus. She knew that he was very powerful. He, she, had, she had seen, she had heard that he was able to heal people of sickness. And she also recognized here in this comment, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died, that if he was there, he very well could have even not just healed him, but could have prevented his death. And so here we see Martha having this very high view of Jesus. She viewed Jesus, you could say, as this miracle worker. A person who has some special powers. The ability to heal people from sickness and even prevent a death. HCC, let it be known today that there are a multitude of high views of Jesus that are being promoted by our society and our culture. Many people have a high view of Jesus. Non-Christian religions, they too, they have a high view of Jesus. Consider Islam and Muslims. They have a high view of Jesus. They view Jesus as a prophet of God in a long line of prophets. And consider even Mormons. Mormons also have a very high view of Jesus. They view him as the first spirit child of Elohim, of the God of this world. And even Hinduism. Hindus have a very high view of Jesus. They view him as a, as a model, as an example of somebody who has achieved this high spiritual state of self-realization. Not only do other religions have a high view of Jesus, but I would even say that there are many people who go to church regularly, who may even call themselves Christians, 
who also have a high view of Jesus. Some of these particular individuals, they view Jesus as a very insightful teacher, has some great spiritual insights as to just exactly who God is. Some people, they have a high view of Jesus, that fact that he was a great moral teacher. He was able to tell people what was right and wrong, what was good and bad. Other people, they view Jesus as being a great leader. He was able to attain and to amass a great following. And he was able to, with this particular following, influence the world in a godly way. HCC, let it be known that there are many high views of Jesus. But we need to know that we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus, we're to have not just a high view of Jesus, we're to have a holy view of Jesus. We are to view Jesus as being completely other. We are to view Jesus as being in a class, in a status of his own. We need to view Jesus, the fact that he is truly unique, that he is one of a kind, that there is no one, that there is nothing that can even come close to how great, how majestic, how awesome, how holy Jesus truly is. And so here we see Jesus after encountering Martha on his way to Bethlehem. And we see Martha uttering to him this high, or expressing to him this very high view of him. We see Jesus now challenging Martha's high view of himself with this following statement. I believe Jesus wants to take Martha's faith and push it to the next level, so to speak, when he says this, In verse number 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And so here we see Jesus desiring to instill within Martha, this person whom he loves, whom he cherishes, who he has a special relationship with. He desires Martha to know him in a complete way, not in an an incomplete way, but in a complete way, in a holy way. She, or excuse me, he wants her to know him for who he truly is. H.C.C., We need to know Jesus in the same way. I think many of us here today, we are guilty of having a high view of Jesus, but we don't have a holy view of Jesus. We need to have this understanding of Jesus that completely and utterly just blows our mind. And how do we gain that particular understanding of just exactly who Jesus is? Well, we do what we're doing right now. We hear it from the horse's mouth. We go straight to the word of God and we see what Jesus, and we see how Jesus describes himself. And here he describes himself as the resurrection and the life. Let's take a look at those two concepts. First of all, Jesus, he revealed that he, or he says there in verse 26, I am the resurrection. With this initial statement, Jesus revealed that he was capable of powerfully restoring people's physical life. With this statement here, let me say that again. Jesus, he revealed that he was more than capable of powerfully restoring people's physical lives. First of all, death is not the end to our existence. That has been a popular thought over the last hundred years or so. When you die, it is not the end. When you die, you need to know that your soul, your spirit is, and I'm going to say this and it'll make sense in just a couple seconds, is temporarily separated from your physical body. 
and your soul and your spirit that goes on to, when I'm just going to refer to it for right now, as the afterlife. And that is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches this particular understanding of death, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. And the Bible teaches that death is not the end, not just for our soul, not just for our spirit, but also for our bodies. Once we die, our bodies are not done. You could say that God, and I'm just making this up on the spot so I could be theologically inaccurate here, and you guys can come after me and you may be totally right. It's almost like God hits the pause button, so to speak, on our bodies just for, just for a little bit, just for a little bit of time. And this belief, this understanding of death, this this belief, this understanding of our souls, of our spirits going on into the afterlife and, and, and our bodies being put on hold, it was taught throughout the entire Bible. And like I said, it just wasn't a New Testament teaching. This is found throughout the Old Testament as too. In the Old Testament, you got Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. He says this, Your dead shall live. Your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust. So he's like speaking to the people who have already died. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. And then in the best book in the entire Bible, the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, also endorses and promotes this understanding of the afterlife and our bodies being temporarily put on hold. He says there, many of those who sleep in the dust, that's symbolic of death and being buried, many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake. And then it goes on and says this, some to everlasting life, and then some to shame and everlasting contempt. Martha had this understanding of death. She had this understanding that one day that her brother's body would come back to life. We see that in verses 23 and 24. In verse 23 and 24, Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again. And then verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So it's almost like Martha just kind of viewed Jesus' comment here. Hey, Martha, just so you know, your brother, he's going to be resurrected. He's going to come back to life. This is not the end for him. This is not the end for his body. And Martha just kind of took that particular statement there as just like a, like a nice like a nice saying that you would say for somebody at a funeral. He says, I know. This is what I've been taught since I was a little girl. I've been taught that in the end, that everybody will rise again, that their bodies will come back to life. And Jesus is here challenging, beginning to challenge her understanding of just exactly who he is. Earlier in Jesus' ministry, Jesus revealed his authority over death. In Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43, it's also, this particular account is also found in Matthew's gospel and also Luke's gospel. Uh, Jesus, uh, we see him in a very powerful way, uh, restoring life to a religious leader's daughter who had previously died. And his name was Jairus. And in that passage in Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through 43, we see Jesus showing up to Jairus' house. And the mourners are outside. They're all weeping. They're all crying. It's a very sad, it's a very somber scene. Understandably so. Jesus arrives. He kicks everybody outside except for the immediate family. And he basically comes to this little girl, to this daughter, takes her by the hand, and she rises up. Absolutely amazing. So we see Jesus there expressing and demonstrating his authority over death. The ultimate way, though, in which Jesus expressed his authority over death was with his own passing, with his own death 
on the cross. And three days after Jesus died on the cross as a substitutionary atonement for the sins of his people, three days after he died on the cross to pay the divinely imposed penalty price for the sinfulness and for the acts of sin that his people had committed, what happened? Jesus came back to life. And Jesus came back to life. His soul, his spirit was reunited with his body. And he walked out of that tomb. And on that first Easter morning, Jesus' resurrection proved that Jesus was or yeah, that Jesus was more powerful than death. It proved that Jesus had overpowered death. It proved that Jesus had conquered death. And this is why we are here today. This is, this is the essence of our, of our being, of our existence. The Apostle Paul makes that very clear in 1 Corinthians so without the resurrection, we're just wasting our time. But the very center of our faith as followers of Jesus is that Jesus, that he is risen again and that he is alive forevermore. HCC, upon our death, like I said just a few moments ago, our souls, our spirits, the immaterial aspect of our being is temporarily separated from our physical bodies. Our physical bodies may be buried in the ground or may be cremated, but let it be known to you that at one point in the future, Jesus Christ, he is going to return. And when he returns, he is going to restore life to our physical bodies by reuniting, permanently reuniting our souls, our spirits with them forevermore. I want you to turn in your Bibles just back just a few chapters to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 verses 25 through 29. John chapter 5, verses 25 through 29 says this. This is Jesus talking. He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is here now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of a judgment. And so this passage right here teaches us that one day, and I believe that this is at the rapture, the part of my eschatology, what I understand how the end times are going to play out. I believe that Jesus Christ, that he is going to descend from heaven. He is going to be in the earth's atmosphere and with an audible word, with a command, just like at the beginning of time when God spoke things into existence, when God spoke life into existence, this text here says that with a command, and Jesus Christ will command our bodies to be restored to life. And at that moment, our souls, our spirits will be permanently reunited with a glorified body. Our bodies, they will be void of sin and the effect of sin. All of the physical ailments that we endure and that we suffer now, they will be permanently and eternally banished from our physical bodies. Our bodies will be made glorious. 
our bodies will be absolutely powerful. They will be imperishable. And then when our souls, our spirits are reunited with our glorified bodies, we then will be ushered into God's immediate and glorious presence with God's people for the rest of eternity. HCC, this is our hope. This is our hope as Christians, as followers, of, as followers of Jesus. And when I say this is our hope, I don't mean this is wishful thinking, like, I hope the lions win today. It's not like that. This is a confident expectation. We know that this is going to take place. How do we know this is going to take place? Because this is what God has told us is going to, is, is going to occur. This is our destiny. So me as a pastor, whenever I go to funerals, funerals of, Christ, of, of a fellow Christian, of a fellow brother or sister in Christ, I need to just kind of let you into a little bit of the insight of what I'm thinking. Yeah, I definitely go there, and I'm sad. There are many dear saints that I know, many dear brothers and sisters who've been a part of our congregation who have passed away, who have gone on to be with the Lord. And when I arrive at that particular funeral, at that particular service, I am sad. I am going to temporarily miss their presence in my life. But I also want you to know that I go that particular funeral of a Christian with great joy and knowing that, hey, they are right now with Jesus. They are right now in God's immediate and glorious presence forevermore. There have been some people who have been close to death. And I've gone and I have visited with them. And I tell them, hey, i got to be brutally honest with you. I'm a little bit jealous right now of you. Because just in a matter of a few hours or a few days or whatever it may be, you are going to be with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the rest of God's people who have gone on before us. And I also got to tell you this. Sometimes... I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I'll tell you anyways. Sometimes I go and I stand before the, I stand before that casket. You know, the body is typically embalmed and there's makeup on it. And I think to myself, I can't wait till God resurrects this body. It's going to look a whole lot better than what the funeral home did. <laughs> right? As you see, death is not the end. Death is not the end. You could even say that it is like a gateway almost. It's a gateway into God's presence. It's a gateway into heaven. It is, it is something to be actually anticipated and look forward to. You see the Apostle Paul in his letters, and you see him like this internal battle going on. And like part of him wants to stay here, on earth and minister amongst God's people and help them out in their journey and following after Jesus Christ. But then there's also this other side of him that's deeply like, I kind of want to just say, peace out. <laughs> I want to go home and I want to be with Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection. And one day he is going to resurrect our bodies and that day is going to be a glorious day. Amen. Well, in this passage, Jesus says not only that he is the resurrection, but he also says that he is the life. And so here with this comment, Jesus revealed that he was also capable of powerfully redeeming people's personal lives, the lives that they were living right then and there. Before we really dive into the significance of that statement, first of all, we need to realize what Paul teaches in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, and that is the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The reason why everybody dies is because everybody is sinful and a sinner. And that is the price. That is the penalty for being a sinner. 
for being sinful, for committing acts of sin. It is a death. We also need to know, though, that sin has infiltrated every single aspect of our being. We are totally depraved people. And prior to death, sin in our, in our lives that seeks to wreak havoc on every aspect of our personal lives. In particular, sin seeks to damage and or destroy our relationships with the world. Romans chapter 8 talks about how even creation, Paul talks about in this metaphoric way, how creation groans under the weight of sin and how even creation itself yearns for the day when that particular weight of sin is released and it can be redeemed. But sin, it seeks, and it seeks to damage and or destroy our relationship with the world. It seeks to damage and or destroy our relationship with other people, with our neighbors. Sin seeks to create some type of tension between us and the people living next to us or our co-workers or our own children. Sin seeks to even destroy, perhaps even destroy, uh, damage, or perhaps even destroy the relationship that we have with our spouse. Sin also s- seeks to damage and destroy the relationship that we have with ourselves. It does this emotionally. Have us go on all these different types of emotional swings or psychologically. Sin weighs on us mentally. Ultimately, though, sin seeks to damage and destroy our relationship with God. At the moment of conception, the moment in which fertilization takes place, we are conceived in sin. We are sinners. We are at odds with God. We are alienated from Him. The Bible describes us as children of wrath. Let it be known, though, HCC, that this is not how God created man to live. This is not how God intended man to live. The good news here is that God sent His Son to show us how we are to live our lives. God sent His Son to show us how we are to live our lives, conquering sin in our day-to-day activities. If you turn with me to the passage that we were in just last week, John chapter 10, verse 10. This is exactly what Jesus says here. In John chapter 10, verse 10, He says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came to that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus reveals to those people who recognize who he truly is, Jesus reveals to his followers how to live an abundant life, how to live a life that is full of meaning, significance, contentment, and even joy. And joy not just in the good times of life, but even joy in the difficult and in the bad times of life as well. Our worlds today, they attempt to attain the abundant life in so many different ways, void of God. The world says that you can attain the abundant life by being disciplined, by exercising regularly, by being disciplined in what you eat. Discipline in your, in your sleep schedule and how you go about your day-to-day routine. The world says that you can attain the abundant life by being popular, by being famous, by being a celebrity, by getting all sorts of likes on social media and followers on Facebook and Twitter. The world says that you can have the abundant life if you just see, simply keep your head down and work hard. You're going to get that job with that great paycheck and you're going to be able then to buy this toy or that toy or to live in this house and have the abundant life with all of these different possessions that you accumulate through your hard work. The world says that you can have the abundant life by creating all of these experiences, by by 
by traveling overseas and visiting these exotic locations or creating these great um, parties and gatherings with friends and family. The world says that you can gain the abundant life by creating that picture-perfect life that we spoke about briefly last week, the American dream. Let it be known to you, HCC, that all of these different ways in which the world promotes the abundant life can be attained, they do not truly satisfy. You may be able to attain a few of those particular pursuits, and let it be known to you that when you attain that American dream, or when you go to that exotic location, or when you achieve that particular image that you have of yourself, let it be known to you that you're going to, deep down inside, be wanting more. (coughs) The only way to truly attain the abundant life is by actually submitting to Jesus' lordship in your life. That is what the Bible says. That is what Jesus says here. You want the abundant life? Then Jesus is saying, you need to trust me. You need to do what I command you to do. I, as Jesus, need to have authority over every aspect of your life. So, HCC, do you want the abundant life? then you need to do what he instructs you to do in your marriage relationship. Wives, you need to sacrificially submit to your husband. Husbands, you need to sacrificially love your wives. Put her needs before your own. You want to experience the abundant life in your finances? You need to not store up treasures here on earth where where rust and moth destroy You need to use your finances to further the kingdom of God. You need to use them in the eternal perspective. You want to experience the abundant life in your relationship with your loved ones who who are not Christian? Then you need to do what Jesus says, and you need to go and you need to evangelize them. You need to go and tell them just exactly who God is and what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. HCC, trust me when I say that as you trust Jesus, as you obey him in the day-to-day routine of things, which you are going to experience, you are going to experience God powerfully working in your life and through your life. And as God accomplishes his will in you and through you, all of a sudden you are going to realize that man, I've just gained satisfaction in life. This life that I'm living right now is just absolutely glorious. It is more than I could ever imagine. As you see, Jesus is the life. Back in our passage today in John chapter 11, after Jesus revealed himself to be the resurrection and the life, in verse 26, Jesus Christ moved on to ask Martha a very pointed question, a very simple question. Verse 26, at the very end, he says this to Martha, do you believe this? This particular question here challenged everything that Martha previously knew about Jesus. This question here pushed Martha into that holy understanding of Jesus' true identity. She now was asked to believe in a, not just a high view of Jesus, but in a holy view of him. And in verse 27, Martha responded with just as simple of an answer by simply saying, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. So HCC, do you believe this? Do you believe what the Bible has to say about Jesus is true? Do you believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God who came to earth, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross to pay the price for the sinfulness and for the sins of his followers? 
Do you believe that everything that Jesus said, himself, said about himself is true? Do you believe that Jesus is not just the bread of life, not just the light of the world, not just the good shepherd, but do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? If you are sitting here today and you do believe this, I praise God. And I ask that God would, I pray, my prayer for you is that God would continue to work in your life and through your life. If you're sitting here today and you do not know how to answer that question, or if you do not believe that Jesus is what the Bible says he is, then I am praying to God for you. I'm praying that God would open up your spiritual eyes, ears, and hearts to see, to hear, and to receive this good news about him. Well, the story about Lazarus does not disappoint. At the very conclusion of John, or towards a little further on, in John chapter 11 and verses 43 through 44, we see a climax to this story. We see Jesus demonstrating to Martha and also her sister Mary his identity as the resurrection. In verse 43, it says, When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I love that. It's just a simple command. Just like at the very beginning, we have the same thing here, and we'll see it again in the future. Just with a simple word, Jesus Christ commands Lazarus to come out of the grave. And in verse 44, it says, The man who had died came out, and then he came out alive. That is good news, right? HCC, death is not the end. Death is not the end, especially for believers in Jesus Christ. This past week, the queen died, right? The queen passed away, but guess what? Based off of a few comments that she had recently made and throughout more or less a lifetime, I believe that she's truly saved. I believe that she's a born again Christian, and I believe that this is not the end of the this is not the end of the queen. There's a couple of comments that she made. I'm just going to read them for you today. <coughs> uh, just this past Christmas, December 25th, 2021, she said this, and I quote: "Jesus, whose teachings have been handed down from generation, have been the bedrock of my faith." His birth marked a new beginning, as the Christmas carol says, the hope and fear of all the years are met in thee tonight. And then just a few weeks ago, a month ago, August 3rd, 2022, the queen said this, and I quote, throughout my life, the message and teachings of Christ have been my guide, and in them I find hope. ACC, I hope that you also find hope in Jesus' words, that he is indeed the resurrection and the life. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We want to thank you so much for this day that you've given us. We want to thank you for this opportunity that you've provided us with to gather here, to open up your words, to consider your son's words his statements that he is the resurrection and the life. And I pray that we would continue to build our lives and our church upon this glorious truth. And dear only Father, I pray once again that if there's anyone here today that does not know you and know your son in this personal and powerful way, that you would open up their spiritual eyes, ears, and hearts to see, to hear, and to receive this truth. And Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your son Jesus. We want to thank you for his death on the cross. We want to thank you for the hope that you have given us through him. We pray this prayer in his powerful name.